Joshua chapter 5. Have I already said Joshua 5? If I have not, I'll tell you now. Open your Bibles to Joshua chapter 5. I'm so glad y'all are here. I, we did have a guest this morning. I saw you. God bless you. What's your name? It's so nice to meet you. And how dare you come to church on this kind of Sunday morning? <laughs> Clap your hands for our visitor one more time. We love you. Bless you. Thank you for being here. Joshua chapter number five, verse number one. And it came to pass when all the kings of the Amorites, which were on the side of the Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard, circle that word, heard, that the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel until we were passed over, that their heart melted. Whose heart melted? Those that heard. Neither was there spirit in them anymore. Why? Because of the children of Israel. At that time, the Lord said unto Joshua, make sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. And Joshua made him sharp knives and circumcised the children of Israel at the hill of the foreskins. And this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise. All the people that came out of Egypt that were males, even all the men of war, died in the wilderness, by the way, after they came out of Egypt. Now, all the people that came out were circumcised, but all the people that were born in the wilderness, by the way, as they came forth out of Egypt, them they had not circumcised. For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness till all the people that were men of war, which came out of Egypt, were consumed because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord my God, unto whom the Lord swore that he would not show them the land, which the Lord swore unto the fathers that he would give us a land that what? Flows with milk and honey. And their children whom he had raised up in their stead when them Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised in the way. And it came to pass when they had done circumcising all the people that they abode in their places in the camp till they were what? Whole or healed. And the Lord said unto Joshua, this day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. Wherefore the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day day. I'm going to preach a message this morning entitled, My Next Move. I need you to tell about three people around you, my next move. Watch, watch my next move. Let's, let's pray just for a moment. Father, we thank you now for the reading of your word, and we ask you to anoint us, and I thank you for the people that are here in this sanctuary that braved this storm to come to your house to receive a word that is relevant to their prophetic purpose in this earth. And Father God, I pray that you will just anoint this whole service this morning with the oil of gladness. Thank you, Lord God, that you've removed any kind of heaviness from our life. We rebuke depression and discouragement and despondency. We speak against every distortion that would, the enemy would send in anybody's minds. And Father, we thank you for clarity of thought. And for the next few moments of time, move us forward into our prophetic future, and we give you praise for it. Lord, we pray for the people that are watching on Facebook Live and PlaceForLife.tv and all the people who are tuned in now, that you would touch them right in their home, in the hospital, wherever they are watching us, that you would touch them just like you're touching us. And we lift our hands and we say, Lord, have your way. Speak, Lord, your servants are listening. We bind every generational spirit and break every generational curse. And we thank you now, God, for what you're about to accomplish in all of our lives in Jesus' name. Would you give him praise one more time, saints, with clapping your hands? Come on, y'all. Shout to God with a voice of triumph. Clap your hands, all ye people. Bless your name, Jesus. High five three people and tell them it's on in the building right now. <clears throat> so we've been talking about in our church movement. We've been talking about advancing, 
it just was a few weeks ago that we introduced to you the concept of the gates out of Isaiah chapter 62 and verse number 10. The gates represent portals and passages that God drops out of eternity into time. These gates represent opportunities for you to move from one phase of your purpose to the next phase of your purpose, from one term of your time to the next term of your time. So progress is very important in relation to your purpose in the earth. Can you say amen to that? So movement, promotion, growth, advancing, going forward is very important to your assignment in the earth. Amen. So my prayer for you is that you're going higher and that you're going further. Amen. That all limitations are being removed from you and that the gates that God has dropped in front of you, you will pass through them with a spirit of urgency. Can you say amen to that? It's time for us to make our passage, to make our move, to make our progress. And so when you read Joshua chapter number five, something very interesting has transpired. They have now made it into the promised land, but there's no progress once they have arrived. Are y'all in the building? So there are four laws of movement. Number one, there is progress. It means to move onward. It means the way forward or the way upward. The four laws of movement. Number one, progress. The way forward, onward, or upward. The second law of uh, movement is transgress, which is the violation of the principle of progress or crossing the lines of progress, okay? That's transgress. So when there's a transgress, it interrupts progress. Anytime there's transgression, it will always delay progression. Are y'all with me now? Third law of movement is ingress. Ingress is the way in or the means of entering a thing. And finally, the, third, the fourth law of movement is egress, which means the way out. Are y'all with me? The action or the right to exit. Now let me just go ahead and decree and declare a thing over you for the next 20 minutes of time. You're gonna be exiting some things that has been hindering you and restricting you, and you're gonna be entering some things that God has preordained for you to enjoy. I just need to know if there's anybody in the building ready to make a move. If you're really ready to make a spiritual move in your life, I need you to take 10 seconds and give God an enthusiastic praise like you're about to move to the next level of living. Come on, y'all. You're, you're about to move to the next level of living. No more limitations. No more boundaries in Jesus' name. Come on, high five somebody and tell them it's time to make your move. So movement is the changing of position. You may be seated. The changing of position to go or pass to another place. There's no movement without continuous motion. There's no movement without continuous motion. Hmm. All right. So let me just say it like this. Activity does not denote progress. Activity does not denote progress. So for there to be movement, there has to be motion. So all motion is an addendum or all motion is in proportion to the quantity of the mover. Woo! In other words, it's hard to direct a ship that isn't moving. Some of you are wondering why it's taken you so long to move out of where you've been to the place that God has preordained you to be. It's a capacity problem. In other words, what you carry in is so large, it don't move that fast. But once you get to moving, then God adds momentum to your motion. In order for you to have momentum, you have to catch the root, which is moment. Moment is the root of momentum. So God gives us moments in time that we must grasp, we must catch. And a moment is not 60 seconds. A moment is an experience or an encounter with God. So what I came by to tell you is do not let this moment pass you by because this service could add velocity to your vision that you never had till you arrived here. 
This service could be the moment that you leave everything that's been holding you back, every cycle and vortex that's been pulling you down. This moment could launch you out of this particular situation. I just need to know if there's anybody ready to catch velocity in your vision. Velocity is when God imparts speed to something. I'm going to say it again. Velocity is when speed is imparted to something that's already moving. So get ready because velocity is coming your way. Somebody shout praise God. Praise God. Well, I've preached enough. If you ain't got something by now, just, you know, get another sip of caffeine and come back and talk to me one more time because you just got a boatload of info right there. And that's, you could whoop the devil with your notebook now. If you wrote anything down, the devil show up, just hit him with your notebook. <laughs> hit him with your ink and paper. And he got to back up. That was a boatload of revelation. How many of you know you can whoop the devil with your notebook? <laughs> Woo, I'm feeling this thing. So at this point, they've entered the promised land, but they cannot move forward in position. And there are certain things that they had to overcome. Now watch what the Bible says. The Bible says that these enemies had heard about what God had done for his people. Let me tell you something. Just like people hear about the goodness of God in your life, so does every enemy. Can I go ahead and prophesy to you and tell you God has done such great things in your life that the enemy must recognize what God has shown as favor on your life? Somebody shout, devil, you better recognize. Woo, Lord. So he begins to deal with them concerning their reputation. The Bible says in verse number one that it came to pass when all the kings of the Amorites which were on the side of the Jordan and all the kings of the Canaanites which were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters from the children of Israel. Here's what I'm convinced of. The enemy is more afraid of what God has done for you many times than we really appreciate what God has done for us. If you ever have a question if God's going to get you through your next storm, look at your last storm. That thing could have killed you, but you're sitting in church today. So reputation is a powerful thing. So really God sent a reputation in the ears of the enemy. Now your reputation is strong. Come on, somebody shout it. I got a bad reputation. The enemy know he don't want to mess with me. Now, you know, reputation can help you. It can hurt you. Reputation is really the opinion of the public towards you. Your reputation is not located in you. Now, don't miss that. Your reputation is not located in you. I'm going to just let it sit there on you. It resides in the minds of other people. Therefore, you really have no control over it. You can help it, but you can't control it. So I... I want to tell you, leave your reputation for others to debate. It has nothing to do with you. What you think of me is really in your own mind. If you spend your whole life trying to fix your reputation for everybody else's approval, you ain't never going nowhere. There's only one endorsement you need. The Lord is my light and my salvation. If you have his endorsement, the enemy can't do nothing to stop what God has favored you to do. So Joshua catches this anointing to drive out certain things. And I won't go through it all. But in order for him to possess the promised land, he had to let 
something transpired and God said, what you need right now is a favor from me. So I'm going to send a word out into the ears of your enemies before you ever arrive. And what y'all don't realize is the, the, the Lord's already speaking to your enemies about your progress. In other words, you don't act like the enemy has the capacity to stop you. The only thing that has the capacity to stop you is you. Talk back to me in this building. Oh, I love the Lord. Don't you love him? Let me just stop and throw this out there. If the enemy could have killed you, he would have already killed you. So Joshua was anointed to contend with these ites. When he gets to the promised land, he got a deal. And we covered them a little while ago. I'll just go through them real quick. The first group he got to deal with is the Hittites, which means terror by confusion or panic or anxiety. It's a spirit of fear. And just let me help you on with that. No more confusion in your calls. In Jesus' name. No more panic attacks. No more panic attacks. No more anxiety attacks. No more phobias in Jesus' name. No more trepidation in Jesus' name. God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. You have the power to drive fear out of your life. You can lay down in your bed at night and sleep in comfort and in peace. Somebody shout, no fear in my house. The Hivites were number two, which are villagers. Hmm. Those that take up residence, they not welcome, but they show up and stay. <laughs> are y'all with me? In other words, these spirits show up. They not welcome and they make a habitation among you. You need to let every kind of spirit that shows up in your life know every kind of spirit is not welcome in your life. Don't complain about what you tolerate. Parasite, to be unwalled without walls. It's a spirit. Hear me, it's a spirit that causes us to live undisciplined lives. My Bible tells me a city without walls has no defense. It's like a man without self-control. It's time for us as born again believers to get our walls back, our walls of defense. That includes your convictions as well as your disciplines. Stop saying yes to everything. Stand up and tell something no. I'm going through then what about these Gergeshites? A stranger is drawing near. Strange spirits, off spirits. Man, listen to me. Off spirits cause atmospheric turbulence. Off spirits show up in your life, recognize it. Take note of it. Know that God didn't send that up in your life. If it's strange, it ain't God. I wish I had time to work on all these spirits because too many people tolerate these spirits and live with these spirits in their life. And God has anointed you to drive these spirits out of your life, to drive them out of your destiny, to drive them out of your purpose, to drive them out of your homes. And let me tell you what you tolerate, your children gonna have to battle. Then the Jebusites, which means intimidation. Who inhabited the city of David? It was the Jebusites. And what did they say? You'll never get in here. Because the Jebusites work out, always work out of intimidation. The spirit of intimidation is a spirit of threatening. The devil always sets in the wings of your purpose, threatening you, daring you to make a move. Threats will always lock you out of the promises of God. Treat a threat like it is. It ain't nothing but wind and word. Tell it to go back to the source it came from. Somebody need to stand up and tell the devil, don't threaten me one more time. I'm going to do everything God told me to do. I'm going to have everything God told me to have. I don't feel intimidated. I don't feel threatened. I don't feel confused. I don't feel strange. It is mine in Jesus' name. Take a 10-second praise break and give God praise like you just drove those spirits out of your life. Come on, tell somebody, don't tolerate that stuff. Yeah. 
I got 10 more minutes. Y'all gonna help me preach this word? 10 more minutes. But now listen to this. Now listen to Bishop carefully. All of those spirits I just went through or all of those ites I just went through, all these people groups I just went through did not hear. Only two heard, Hector. The Amorites and the Canaanites, according to our text, verse one. Only two heard. And I believe this, it's because these two have influence over all the other ones. The first group that heard was the Canaanites. The Canaanites mean the merchant or the peddler. The spirit of buying and selling. It's the free agent mentality. It's the spirit in churches to say, I'm not appreciated, so I'll go somewhere else. The Canaanite spirit can't ever get settled, can't ever plant always up for the highest bidder, always looking for the next open position in another area. But they can't just sit down and be still until God says, now I'm about to, your gift will make room for you. And we got too many people that put their gift up to the highest bidder. <laughs> Let me help you with it. Your gift might get you in a place, but your character is the only thing that's gonna keep you there. What did you just say, Bishop? Stop prostituting your gift. Bishop, you preaching so good. If I had a retractable arm, I would slap myself behind my own head. The Canaanite spirit got to go. The Canaanite spirit is hurting the church today. That's why we have revolving church. So the Canaanites heard. The next group that heard was the Amorites. Okay, yes it is. I agree with you. Good 411. Amorite is to publicize, to gossip. That's what it means, to publicize, to gossip. Because you heard it don't mean you're supposed to publicize it. But the intention of publicizing it is to hurt somebody. It's to cause slander, to scrutinize, always questioning. You can't lead people that's always questioning everything you're doing because you're always giving answers and you're never advancing. But why are you doing it like that? Why are we doing it like that? Why? I didn't ask you. Talk back to Bishop this morning and be careful what you repeat. If you didn't see it with your own eyes, then you have no business repeating it with your mouth. Gossip has hurt us for too long. It's malicious slander has hurt the body of Christ for too long. Listen, people of God, saints of God, let's watch our mouth. Amen. So it's the Amorites and the Canaanites that heard what God had done for his people. And the Bible says that their heart melted. It means to waste or faint with fear or to be discouraged in their motive. Woo! I'm going to help you right now. When you face facing all that Canaanite and Amorite spirit, don't start defending all that. Leave that up to God. Because God says if you be quiet, I'll put a reputation out there that they don't want to mess with. If you let me work for you, then they'll start seeing what I'm doing for you and they'll have to stop talking about you. I'm gonna go ahead and prophesy God's about to do something so big in your life, the enemy's gonna have to recognize it. The devil gonna have to say only God could do that for them. If you are ready for a big thing to happen in your life, give God praise one more time. Come on, bump somebody and tell them, I'm going there, honey. We moving. And the Amorites and the Canaanites know we coming. And they can't do nothing about it. So that's the reputation. Let's look at the reproach. <laughs> In verses 2 through 7, and I won't repeat it again because I think you got the message clear when I read our text, the Bible keeps saying that he circumcised them and he circumcised them and he circumcised them. He circumcised them over and over until it's almost uncomfortable to read. Because God keeps saying un they were uncircumcised and he circumcised them. They were uncircumcised, but he circumcised them. Over and over, he repeats it over and over. 
And he said, now this is called Gilgal, Gilgal because I've rolled away the reproach. When did he roll, roll away the reproach? After everything that did not belong there was cut off. The disgrace, the embarrassment. It literally means, reproach literally means the expression of disapproval. All of us want to be affirmed. All of us want to be approved. All of us want to be endorsed. All of us want that pat on the back saying you're doing a great job. But let me help you. Life's not like that. There's going to always be gainsayers and naysayers telling you you don't qualify or telling others he don't qualify. But God said, I'm about to cut the reproach off. It literally means a cause or occasion of blame. There's a spirit that attaches itself to people. There's always blaming at somebody else. It's somebody else's fault that you're not going forward. Well, if it wasn't for him, I would be doing, if it wasn't for them, this would happen. And it's your fault that I'm not moving forward. Always blaming somebody else, always excusing your lack of progress because somebody else did something to you. It's a victim mentality. I came by to tell you that God is about to circumcise that from your life, which means he's going to curtail. The word circumcise literally means to curtail, which means to send it back where it came from. All of us have gone through seasons in our life that we are ashamed of. They brought shame to us. Not some of us, all of us. Because if we gave our real testimony, we would cover our head with a paper bag. Because we don't want nobody knowing everything we did. Because the stuff that really brought shame, you ain't going to testify about that. You might do it from a closet, but you ain't going to do it publicly because all of us got shame in our past. Never let toxic shame stop you from moving forward in your prophetic purpose. I came by to tell you God is taking spiritual scissors this morning and he is curtailing. He is cutting off everything that has brought shame to your life. Come on, go ahead and shout it right now. There's no more shame in my game. No more, come on, shout it, it's gone. All shame is gone. Come on, say it until you believe it. No more shame in my game. Listen, y'all, the enemy wants you to wear shame. The enemy wants you to be embarrassed. The enemy wants you to be ashamed. The enemy wants you to walk around apologizing for living. But I came by to tell you, no more apologizing for you. No more shame in your game. Do not be embarrassed. Lift up your head. Square your shoulders and tell the devil you're not holding me as a prisoner of my past, not another day. If you believe it, you ought to give him praise real quick. Bless your name, Jesus. So number one was the re re reputation. Number two was the reproach. And I'm trying to preach this as fast as I can. So he had to circumcise them, which means to cut away the reproach, to curtail the shame. It has to do with covenant. In other words, Bishop, am I right by saying this, that in the Old Testament, you could not be in covenant with God until there was circumcision. That is correct. We all know that, right? Now watch what I'm telling you. It's hard to lead a people that do not live in covenant with God. Now, that's a very simple statement, but that's a very strong impact. It's very difficult to lead people forward that do not live in covenant. Not talk about covenant, not agree with covenant, but live in covenant. If you read verse four of our text, all of the covenant men of circumcision are now gone. If you read verse 5, there are people who had been delivered that had not been circumcised. Come on, Bishop. Oh, y'all didn't get that right there. There are people in the group that made it over, but they had not been circumcised. Just because you made it through some stuff don't mean you in covenant. Just because you live in, in the area or in the proximity of your promise does not tell us you have been circumcised from everything that brought shame into your life. Preaching good now. 
And verse 6 tells you because of disobedience, an entire generation was lost. Verse 7 tells us there was another generation raised in their stead. God is never without a people. Are you glad you're part of that people? Well, you're only part of that people if you live in covenant. Reputation, reproach. Now, God wants to cut the reproach off of your life, but he wants you to live in covenant with him, which means you have to sign up. Tell somebody, pull your pen out today, baby. We all signing up. Amen. All, listen, the most frustrating thing for a leader is to know that God is calling a corporate body somewhere. And he's trying to pull people instead of lead people. When the people get on fire for prophetic progression of purpose, it's easy for leaders to lead them. But if leaders are always pulling, it's draining their energy and their time and their heart. It's time for the people to push leaders and tell leaders, come on, man, take us somewhere. Show us some direction. Give us a way to go. And I came by to tell you, God ain't done the last great thing in your life. You better get ready because God is leading you into a wealthy place, a healthy place. Come on, bump your neighbor and tell him, I'm going. <laughs> Say it with me, reputation. reputation. Reproach. reproach. Last one. <laughs> now, now that's, that's somebody with you right there. <laughs> recover. Say it, recover. recover. Verse 8 says, and it came to pass when they had done circumcising all the people, that they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. After the reproach, after the reputation, it's time to recover. Now watch this. What I love about this here now, Pastor Josh, and yeah, I'm, I'm about to take off run around this building because I feel this thing all over me more than any place else. What I love about this passage of scripture is he didn't ask them or command them or tell them to do any circumcision until he had already paralyzed the enemy in their future. In other words, God did not require some deep cutting commitment from his people till he halted the enemy from attacking them. When God is doing a deep work, he speaks to the enemy. Don't fool with my people right now. I'm working on them. And some of y'all been wondering what's going on and I came by to tell you, God's been fixing you for your future. And he's not let the enemy, he's held the enemy at bay while he works on you. You can't fight half healed. You can't fight a proper battle until you're completely whole. Hmm. came to pass when they had done circumcising how many of the people? All the people. That's what I'm telling you. That they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. Whew. Strong stuff, y'all. Everybody say, hold your place. <laughs> they abode where? Elder Smith in their what? Place. Here's what happens. God starts messing with a corporate group of people he starts messing with the entity or the institution called the church or the local assembly or whatever you want to call it, the community of believers, the congregation of God, what you want to call it. <laughs> whatever you want to call it, he starts fixing them and here's what happens. People start jumping around because they are uncomfortable that God is trying to fix them. And he's saying, I got to get you right because if you ain't right, we ain't right. Because God is a God of interrelated reality. If you touch one of us, you touch all of us. So we need one of us to be healed so all of us can be healed. For all of us to move forward, every one of us move forward. But we can't move forward until he's healed. So when God starts cutting away in your life, it's not time for you to start jumping all around. 
move in place to place. Plant yourself and be still until God is finished working on you. You can't walk right until you let him work right. Bump your neighbor, tell him, be still and let him finish it. Woo! One version says they sat still as they were without attempting anything until they were revived and recovered. That's strong, y'all. They abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. You are not moving until you are whole. You are not going anywhere until your private areas are healed. Stay right where you are until I can touch any area in your life and you don't flinch. Until the preacher can preach on anything from the Bible and you don't jerk around. It's time for preachers to stop preaching messages that you know, I'm scared somebody might not. But, but if it's in the Bible, open that B-I-B-L-E. Read the scripture and preach the Bible. If people jerk and flinch, let them be healed. I pray in God just cut all over you right now until he cuts everything off that don't belong in your destiny. Every relationship that's not of God, God cut it off. No matter how comfortable we are with it, if it's stopping us, cut it off. Hmm. The verb translated healed until they were healed means live. Huh. That they sat in their place until they could live. Folks, let me tell you, it's horrible living halfway done. I'll say it even better than that. It's hard to live with one foot in and one foot out. It's hard to live like that, y'all. You need to make up your mind. Either I'm all the way in but don't make yourself miserable. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. A house divided against itself cannot stand. If you're going to be in the canoe, at least. Tell your neighbor, how does it feel to sit next to George Jefferson, baby? Because I'm about to move on up. And you can either come with me or you can stay right here. But as for me and my house, we ain't staying here no more. We telling God, operate, fabricate, whatever you got to do, but we ain't staying here no more. How many of you are ready to move on to the next place? I'm going to give you 30 seconds to give God the craziest praise you ever gave him in your entire life. Come on, y'all, praise him until you feel something shifting in your atmosphere. Praise him until something moves in the matter that you are carrying in this earth. Come on, y'all, praise him until you feel him pushing everything out that don't belong in your life. Come on, y'all, praise him until stuff that's been making you uncomfortable now becomes uncomfortable because of your praise. You want to lift your hands and throw your head back and open your mouth and praise him with all your heart. Make the enemy uncomfortable about even thinking about messing with you. There you go, Papa. Walk it out. 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 Now watch, here's how, here's how, and do you remain standing? Here's how imperative and important present truth is. So present truth runs parallel to revelation. Truth is truth no matter what day it is. But present truth is truth that is manifested, truth that is expressed, truth that is revelational. So revelation and present truth run at the same time. 
So all of a sudden you come in and you preach a right now truth. And it becomes revelation. You've read this story a hundred times, but when it becomes revelation to you, it's present truth. In other words, what I just told you, now you got a word. And that's why, that's why verse nine is so important. The Lord said now, Joshua ain't saying nothing now. The Lord said, now y'all done done all this, now God gonna speak. And the Lord said two words, this day. Somebody shout, this day. See, if you'll get this right here, this will be this day for you. Are you ready? This day have I rolled away the reproach from off you. But you got to get this present truth for it to be this day. You got to get this revelation for it to be this day. If you want it rolled off of you. Now watch. Gilgal means a wheel. It means to roll or to revolve. Well, until he rolls the reproach off of you, you cannot roll into your future. You cannot revolve and evolve into the person God ordained you to be. Tell your neighbor, I'm about to roll on in this place. Tell him, I'm about to roll out of where I used to be. And I'm about to roll over anything that's trying to stop me. And I'm about to roll around what I can't roll over. But I'm going to move because today I'm in Gilgal. And today it's been rolled off me. Because stuff left me, now I'm free to move in to everything God promised me. Come on, shout it. No shame in my game. I'm rolling forward. If you're ready to move with some momentum, I dare you to give God one more praise like you love him with all your heart. Praise the name of the Lord. There's nothing about, lift those hands please, there's nothing about I minister to you this word. There's nothing about apostolic anointings that is apologetic. Apostolic anointing is always advancing. Jesus said the kingdom of God suffer the violence, the violent take it by force. There is an, an aggressive anointing that must come on the people of God. Passivity has replaced passion in churches. Passivity has replaced passion in preachers. Yes, Lord. Are y'all hear what I'm telling you? Read the Bible. Jesus was passionate about everything he did. These men of God like Joshua, these leaders were passionate about possessing what God had ordained for them to possess. Until you're passionate enough to circumcise people. That's some passion, man. Until you get that passionate about having everything, I feel y'all, come on with that music, come on. Until you get that passionate about having everything God ordained you to possess, welcome to your future. I wanna know if there's any passionate praises in this place. How many of you convinced that? 